Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you've heard me speak before, um, I am doing my bit. So one point out, I'm recycling my wardrobe. Um, but this is a new presentation, I assure you. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, as I said, this is about applying that 1% rule of marginal gains. So I don't know anyone in the room recognises this gentleman, not known for sustainability. This is Sir David Brailsford. He was the GB cycling coach. You can see on the corner of his shirt there. And he revolutionised sports coaching. So working across the GB team, he turned up and broke everything that we're doing down to all of the individual principles that go to winning. Um, <clears throat> he inherited a team who basically had pretty much won nothing since I believe it was 1908. Um, and he set about rebuilding one set at a time, saying actually how do we make every little thing better? Um, clearly you're not going to completely transform what a bike looks like, human beings are human beings. But it wasn't just fitness, it wasn't just the bike, it was sleep patterns. It was looking at the dust accumulation in the back of the mechanic's van, which was affecting the impact of the bikes. So he set off on what was a very long journey, which obviously, if you've been looking at all the, all the slides over the last two days, we're all, we're all on a long journey, We've got a goal to achieve. And taking these little steps at a time, making the tyres slightly more friction resistant, making the helmet slightly more aerodynamic, cleaning the back of the mechanics van. Um, it must have felt like it was a really slow change, particularly when you're dealing in the business of speed. <laughs> but it worked. They started to turn a corner in 2004. They won two gold medals, more than they'd won since 1908. But the whole point about the, um, in the marginal gains and this 1%, 1%, 1%, is they clearly they start to compound and they accelerate. And ultimately, that accumulated um, in 2008, 2012, they had their best ever return with eight golds in both. Obviously, that included London, so the Brits were all very pleased with that, that performance. And ultimately, what I believe we can take those principles of saying, rather than looking for the silver bullet, because that's what Sir David recognised, there was no silver bullet. Yeah, he wasn't going to go away with putting an engine on the bike. Right? So he had to look for what are all of these little things and all going to accumulate. And when we're talking about our sustainability objectives, whether it be carbon reduction, whether it be social, whether it be packaging reduction, whatever they might be, there are no silver bullets. So we've got to look at all of these incremental gains. Not only have we got that cumulative impact of those individual steps, but we've got the shared impact so the lesser known statistic was actually GB cycling isn't just around the velodrome. There's, there's road, there's BMX, et cetera. And all of these were shared across those different disciplines, resulting in, I want to say, I think it's about 59 world championship um, wins across his tenure. I'd argue that's a pretty successful principle. And today, I want to say, actually, how do we apply that to our own goals, right? How can we, how can we win? How can we get there? together. Clearly we're all here, we all recognise there's a huge challenge, you know, we've seen weather disruptions, you know, beyond probably what anybody recognised and many years ahead of predictions, you know, we've had droughts in Europe, we've got half of Pakistan flooded and hundreds of thousands displaced. So we have an Olympic sized challenge. Right? We've already exceeded five out of our nine planetary boundaries. We need to recruit carbon intensity relative revenue by 92%. And we need to do all of that by minimising the impact of the trade-off between social, economic, environmental. So not only do we not know there's one silver bullet, there can't be one silver bullet. Because if I make a big change in one place, if I say I'm going to stop using plastics, I'm going to put everything into cardboard, I need to cut down a load more trees. <laughs> right? I've got, to, I've got to look at lots of different ways of solving the problems across lots of different industries. Our expertise as supply pilot is looking at that from the lens of the supply chain. The supply chain can be factories, it can be farms, it can be the shipping. It's basically, it's where for most companies um, in CPG and manufacturing is their biggest impact lies. Um, statistics between 80 and 95% of 
um, the social and environmental and carbon impact is in the supply chain. But to solve that's hard. It's an Olympic sized challenge. So what do people do? They start and focus on their direct emissions. It's the easiest thing to understand. I know it, I can measure it, I can control it. Don't get me wrong, everyone has to do it, but not at the expense of other things. It's not going to get us there. Right? I can't just work on the nutrition for my cyclists and expect to win. But we've spent 25% of our time on less than 10% of the problem. Right? The clock is ticking. We know when the deadline is. We have to make an impact. And nutrition alone is not going to get you there. Right? You look at, need to look at everything. So just as the day was ready, broke it down and went, I need to look at sleep patterns, nutrition, friction, aerodynamics. I can still never get the idea of the dust out the back of the lorry out of my mind. It just shows the, the level to which they went of what are all of the things I've got to do? And I have to do them all together. Okay? Clearly, I pick one at a time, but they've got to surmount. I can't just go, well, I'm not going to do those because I'm, not going to, I'm never going to get there. So when we look at collaborative things into the supply chain, we break them into these seven types of collaboration. Right? This image um, and the scale that we've got, um, firstly, it's not meant to be absolute. It's not a, not, for most people, it's not a straight line. It's a framework that you can use to look at what's going on within your business and where should you be doing more collaboration. So most people will start with strategic suppliers. It's the classic Pareto principle. I'm going to look at who are my biggest suppliers having the biggest impact and it makes it easier. You know, I, we all know it's complex trying to work with hundreds of suppliers or thousands of suppliers and thousands of materials. So why don't I go and talk to these 10 big suppliers over here because they'll know what I'm talking about. Right? I'm not saying that's wrong. Again, you've got to do it. It's logical. That's where you can have the biggest impact. But it, it, it's, it's not enough on its own. And I'm um, reading um, Tesco was saying, um, it's great, their top 100 suppliers have all reduced carbon by 20%. This was as of late last year. That's great. Being a little bit more sceptical, I would say if Tesco goes to one of their biggest suppliers like Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola were doing it already. They know and understand. Has someone really moved the dial by going and talking to them? Right? What about all of the other suppliers? And when we look, isn't it great that Tesco's done it and Asda's done it and Co-op's done it? They're all going to Coca-Cola. They're all claiming the same 20%. <laughs> Everyone's ignoring the, all the other thousands of companies out there who cannot yet spell GHG and therefore don't know where to start. So doing that Pareto has a huge impact. Right? That's why we do it. That is the whole principle of Pareto. So they're going to work with their strategic suppliers and I'm going to move the needle. But it's not going to move it far enough. Because obviously the other side of the Pareto equation is how much is made up by everybody else. <clears throat> if you look at all of the published statistics of t talking to those companies, so you know, Coca-Cola's made its commitment that they're going to be net zero by, um, forgive me, I want to say um, 2040, it could well be sooner, across their entire business. Um, but they're one of the better ones. Yeah, they have been progressive. They've led the way in many ways. And if it's going to take them 10 to 20, 30 years to achieve net zero, what about the rest? What about the people who are not on this journey yet? So how do we move the dial with those? And if we wait until we've achieved this with all of our bigger suppliers, we run out of time. Yeah? This is a race. We know where the finish line is. And there is no silver medal for not solving the problem. Together, we have to win. And that is the key word from this. It, it's together. So we need to all start working with all of our suppliers to address climate change. And we need to do it, this says now, we need to do it yesterday. So going back to our framework, the, by definition, strategic suppliers are be engaging with a few. Um, to have that impact, and it's, it's simpler. I've got less people, it's, it's less complex. If you want to walk on something like land impact, not every supplier will have a direct land impact. So again, I'm going to be working with some. But the ones I've put on the right-hand side here, you know, resource efficiency is relevant to everybody. 
in our sustainable world, we used to talk about resource efficiency, and then we talked about sustainability, and then we talked about CSG, CSR, and now ESG. And many cases have lost sight of resource efficiency. And I propose we should rediscover it. Resource efficiency is using less of stuff, and using less of stuff normally saves money. And therefore, rather than going to our buyer saying, I've got this new initiative and it's going to cost me money, it's got this new sustainability initiative, how about I've got this resource efficiency initiative and I'm going to take these plastic windows off this packaging and we're going to save 10%. Right? I'm going to take the empty two inch off the top of a Kellogg's, uh, well, empty Kellogg's, take the top two inches off a cereal box because it's empty space, make that box smaller. So this, use this framework. For every business, where these things run along the line will be a little bit different. This, is, this isn't an absolute. So, um, you know, re, uh, renewable energy for many companies, I believe, should be across further to the right because everybody needs to be looking at renewables. So, how do we do this? Um, we've basically got a six step process um, that you can, I think, comply to almost everybody. First step of that process is looking at what is materially important to your business. Most of you will be familiar, familiar with materiality indexes, but this is really looking from the supplier perspective of going, where are they? What are the issues that they're aware of that you're not? What are their obstacles? What are their challenges? And make sure that all forms into you deciding where are you going to look? And where are the opportunities? Where are the low-hanging fruit? Right? Um, the, again, some people say we can't focus on the low-hanging fruit. We've got to solve, find this silver bullet. So absolutely, let's focus on the low-hanging fruit because when we've finished eating all the low-hanging fruit over the next 10 years, someone might have found some silver bullets. But sitting here waiting right now is not helping anybody. So in terms of, here's the example of the sort of things that we work on. It's not exclusively carbon reduction. What's the reason I've got this list is it's about breaking it down. So go back to Sir David Brosford. I talk like I know him. I don't. <laughs> Just very, very keen on what he's achieved. The, he broke it down to those individual things. Because you come to work in the morning saying, how are we going to be carbon zero? It's too daunting. It's too complex. You've got to break it down and say, actually, I'm going to focus on my plastics reduction. I'm going to focus on individual elements. So when you've got those individual elements, next step, set a smart goal for those individual elements. Sounds obvious, but the whole point about smart goals is they need to be achievable, realistic, realistic with a time scale. So you need to check the supply readiness. So actually going out to your suppliers and going, where are you on this issue today? What can you achieve? Because there's no point in me saying that I'm going to have all of my suppliers providing me all of this information by you know, end of this year if they're all those suppliers who couldn't spell GHG I referred to earlier. Right? So where are they on their journey? So I can set goals that's going to move the needle in the right direction. If you've already set a SMART goal, the readiness survey is about actually going and saying, where are they against that? So I'm actually, is it, is it, is it achievable? Is it SMART? And if not, I can make corrective actions to achieve that. Next step is to benchmark and benchmark where they are against that goal. Right? So I've decided, you know, wherever I'm, wherever I'm going, I want to have 30% um, recycled content in all of my plastic packaging. Which products are there today? Which are not? Which have got a plan? Which have not got a plan? So I can actually inform action and decide what I'm going to do. So I can get everybody involved in the conversation. It's about the richness of the conversation between you and all of your suppliers using the tools that allow you to do that at scale. Once you've done that, we're into activation. So I know where they are, I've got my goal, I'm actually going, not just give me this information and you must do by this date, I'm going to give them communications as to why and how and who to short, uh, talk to and shared examples. One of the talks yesterday, a lecturer from, I believe it was Leeds, was saying there's no one's talking about the um, uh, emotional, behavioural science behind this. You need your suppliers to want to change, not just using a big stick saying we've got to change. Um, and the other half of activation is KPIs, sharing KPIs so everybody knows where they stand. It's not about you having the reports and holding the deck and knowing who's good or bad. It's every supplier knowing where they are on the journey. So in the introduction, we talked about the three pillars of communication, accountability, and support. So step four and five is I need to know what I need to do, why and how. I need to know how I'm doing, and I need to know how to get better. 
So scorecarding, it's all about that KPI. If I use my packaging example, yes, I need to know what exactly what weights, et cetera, for plastic tax or EPR or something like that. But what's more important is who's got a plan to achieve what by when. So I know who needs help, where I need innovation, where I'm, they're all, all over it and I can ignore it and put my efforts elsewhere. So I can scale that efficiency. And then the final step in the process is around the commercialization. There's um, research just on the top retailers in the UK suggested that um, over recent years they've left over $8 billion on the table by not bringing customers on the journey with them as they've been making sustainability improvements. Right? Some of that I know is a fear of being had for greenwashing. So actually there's things about what people are willing to say. Um, but I regularly use packaging examples because everybody buys and use packaging every day. But you know, when somebody takes the little plastic window off the front of the pack, rather than put a nice pretty picture on there, why not use that new real estate to say, I've just taken this off of the front of the pack. This is why I've done it. Here's what I've saved. Here's why you should buy this instead of something else. And importantly, here's why you should stop putting in the trash. Because ironically, lots of new recyclable packaging is still going in the trash because no one's told people it's changed and they've been putting in the trash for the last five years. So all of this should be done through a lens of how do you bring consumers on the journey? How do you make that benefit? And if you can do changes with some of your suppliers and some of the products, and then they achieve that gain, other suppliers want to join you on the, on the race. They want to get involved. So you have this cumulative effect. You also have this learning effect. Again, go back to Drivers Railsford. You know, it wasn't just around the velodrome they were winning. They were winning in BMX. They were winning in road. They were, it's, everyone was sharing. And there's many, many statistics around how innovation often comes from the little guy. The little guy is, you know, is he keener? Is he hungrier? Is she not got the same constraints as everybody else? There's many, many theories as to why it happens, but it doesn't alter. A lot of the innovation comes from the little guys. If I go back to earlier graph, if they're not involved in the conversation, we're not sharing that. Yeah? So if everybody's involved, we get that cumulative effect. We can get there, but as I think it was Schneider Electric was saying yesterday, you know, just looking at the 2030 goal, we've, we're a third of the way there in terms of commitments, right? And we are already 25% of the way through the decade. Every five weeks is 1% of the decade, right? Just think on that for a second, yeah? We can't continue to procrastinate. We've got to get everybody in the conversation, everybody making a change. And if it's only 1% this year, right? It'll be 2%, 3% shared gains, and we go back to that drive. So we can do it, but we need to be working with all of our suppliers. We need to be working with all of our suppliers now in a scalable way that helps them achieve what they can achieve. And if that's only one or two percent better, that's better than ignoring them it being nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Um, I'll start with one question, and, it, and it, I guess it will start at the, the beginning for a lot of people here. How difficult can that first conversation be when they're just starting that process, when people are starting that first stage, wh where they maybe really haven't thought enough about this? Is it a particularly challenging conversation sometimes? I actually think the first conversation is one of the easiest. Right. If you start with modest expectations. Yeah. Um, I've shared this with a number of people, but you know, biodiversity is a subject that we all know we need to address. Right. It's regularly at the end of the life, you know, after carbon and social, and it's, and it's because no one knows how to measure it. It's really hard to say how to improve, right? But if you go to your suppliers and say, look, here's what biodiversity means to my brand. There's no global definition, so here's my definition. Here's why it matters to me and our customers. Here's some examples relevant to my industry. You know, make it easy, right? Can you tell me one thing you'll do next year to improve biodiversity? You go out to 4,000 suppliers, 2,000 suppliers, you'll get 80 to 90% of them engage, and we, we pride ourselves on the fact we consistently get 89% engagement, which is um, a real strength. Maybe only 70% of them will say yes, and maybe only 7% will actually do it. But that's 2,000 environmental biodiversity initiatives next year that weren't going to happen that now happen. So it's actually, if you make it practical, which is why it's the 1% piece, 
if you turn up and say, you must get from zero to 100 this year, that's really difficult. Because they've now got the same problem everyone else has got. That's really complex. Where do I start? How do I fund that, etc.? Peel it back to what are the steps that could take us in the right direction? And then it builds its own momentum. Do we have any questions from the room? We have uh, one at the back there, just to my left, if we can get the microphone over there. Luke is coming. He's been working on his 1%. Look at the pace of the man. <laughs> Hi, um, it's Marta from ITP. Hello. Um, it was a great uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank Still you. in the same conversation, uh, for example, we face, we s do work in supply chain um, and we work with different companies and we often face cultural um, kind of like uh, differences which actually makes it hard to have that conversation. I would like to hear um, your point of view on kind of have, how to move that conversation in countries which um, it, is, it, it is still not a thing um, and they do not see the actual profit out of it. So it's, it's a very good question and lots of people struggle with engagement for many reasons. It's cultural, is it people just being secretive, etc. I think it starts with that communication piece of why are we doing this and not just sending a YouTube video that everyone can see that's generic. It's, so, so I'll stick with my biodiversity example if I can, because it's very, very tangible. It's what's my definition of biodiversity, right? And why does it matter to me and why does it matter to my customers, right? Because ultimately that will, because all of your customers yeah, are going, actually, this is going to affect how much I sell to you because you need to sell to your customers. So not promising any huge number, but yeah, this is the way the world goes. This is why we need to move. Right? So that's, I think that's the first piece. It's about the why. It's, a, it's that, um, go back to the behavioural science concept. So it's appealing to the intrinsic motivation. We talk about engaging suppliers. You don't engage suppliers. Suppliers are bricks and mortar. You engage people. So another part of what we do at the readiness stage is about getting to the right person in that organisation. Yeah? So if you're trying to drive a packaging reduction, you need to be talking to the packaging technologist, not the salesman. And again, if you do it in the right way, you get that access to the right person to have the right conversation. The other one is making it um, tangible. The whole principle of the marginal gains is 1% at a time. Don't make it too daunting. Don't make it too complex. Reduce the barrier for them to say no, right? which is why you've got to have the three pillars. You have to support them as well. The, I think the other practical change, I'm just think the best way to frame this, um, if, if you're wanting them to come on, come on the journey, you've got to make, um, you've got to get an open discussion. I don't know is an acceptable answer. So yeah, a really good example with um, speaking to someone earlier about things like the REACH legis chemical legislation, right? Going out, when it very first happened, going out and saying, does your product has SVH chemicals, SVHCs? Does it not? Do you not know, but you think so? And do you not know, but you don't think so, right? That's the honest conversation you'd have if you were face to face. Therefore, do that to start. You have to work through to an issue like that is compliance. You've got to get to the facts. But start with the conversation that someone can go, oh, it's okay for me to admit I don't know. Because then you can segment that audience and say, right, here are the 150 suppliers who I'm going to do a webinar to explain because they don't know, right? I so say, I think that's, that's the difference. It's a lot of these tools, go, people go out with just, do, you must do this and you must give me that information. That's not a conversation. Collaboration in this way is about a conversation. It's an honest conversation that addresses the complexity to work together. So that was such a long answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And I'll just take one more question from the uh, online audience as well. And if we can make this answer relatively short, if that's OK. This is from uh, Ananya. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Ananya. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, could you elaborate on how you activate, uh, conduct a supplier engagement campaign? Well, fortunately, I'm hoping that that question to some extent mm. answers it because it's about taking them on the journey. It's about taking those individual steps. Little nuances like the very first email you get is possibly, it's not, not just a blunt email, it's a 30-second it's a, it's a video from a key stakeholder in your business telling somebody why they should do it. So it's about taking them, it's, the engagement is about a journey. You have to meet them where they are, take them the next step, understand where they are, take the next step. And it's the engagement case all about that, one step at a time. 
James, thank you very much. And if you uh, want to hear more from James, I'm sure you can find you out there in the networking area. Stand number three, I think it is. So a round of applause for James, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.